So welcome everyone to Policies to Reduce Drug Expenditure Without Harming Patients, a Colossus supported seminar provided by Dr. Daniel Goldstein and moderated by myself, Dr. Jonathan Briotti. So just briefly, I'll introduce you to today's seminar. Um, I suppose first of all, thank you all for, for joining us. It's, it's always good to see uh, people. Um, as I said, the seminar is provided as part of the Colossus project. So I'll briefly talk you through Colossus and my own work as part of the consortium. And then I'll give you a little bit of background on Dr. Goldstein and his, uh, his seminar today. So the way things will work is I'll talk for five minutes. Dr. Goldstein will uh, do the actual seminar for 40 minutes. And then we'll have 15 minutes for Q&A. So if you have any kind of burning questions, if you might hold on to them until the end, we'll be able to get to them in a bit more detail. And of course, yes, the seminar is recorded. Um, so you will receive a link when it's over and when the recording is finished processing, and you'll be able to access it and watch it again. But if everyone's ready, we will mute our microphones and we will get started. So yeah, I said the seminar is supported by Colossus. And I suppose the question is who or what is Colossus? It's a one of these, Horizon 2020 projects, and it brings together a multidisciplinary team of 13 different partner organizations from seven different countries. So the, the aim of Colossus is to provide new and more effective ways to classify patients with microsatellite stable rasmutin metastatic colorectal cancer, and also to develop better treatment options for these patients. And it's doing that by applying advanced multi-omic computational modeling uh, approaches to these patients to their samples in order to identify new subtypes of uh, microsatellite stable rasmutin metastatic colorectal cancer. And this helps to predict how these uh, patients will perform under uh, standard of care and also in the provision of more targeted and kind of personalized regimens. Um, so that basically you're giving the right treatments to the right patients at the right time. Um, in terms of the beneficiaries of this project, it's the patients and their families, first and foremost, of course, but looking a bit more into the longer term, we're thinking that clinicians and healthcare systems will definitely benefit from this delivery of healthcare savings. So in terms of my own role in Colossus, um, a little bit about myself, I have a PhD in health economics, and I work with Professor Kathleen Bennett as a health economist here in the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. And we are considering the cost effectiveness of uh, Colossus subtyping in microsatellite stable rasmutin metastatic colorectal cancer. So basically, um, I guess for some context, Colossus has identified these new methods for class classifying this disease um, and subsequently are considering specific combination treatments based on these classifications. So our aim here is really an analysis of the classification in metastatic colorectal cancer in order to study the cost effectiveness of testing and associated novel subtype specific treatment options compared to just kind of standard of care without testing. So in order to do this, we've developed a state transition markup model comprising the natural history of metastatic colorectal cancer, which we developed in the R programming language. And um, currently that sits in an online repository to ensure that the model is both open source, but also fully reproducible. And it kind of supports the, um, the validity of the model to allow other people to at will go and have a look at it and see about the assumptions we've made and choices we, we've come to. So the base case analysis computes an incremental cost effectiveness ratio per the deterministic values of mean costs and benefits. And then sensitivity analysis addresses any kind of uncertainty in the true values of the model parameters and um, via a probabilistic analysis. So we kind of jointly propagate that uncertainty over, say, costs, utilities, and probabilities uh, throughout the model simultaneously. Uh, we also consider, of course, expected value of perfect information. So we expect to output a publication of our results. Um, we are constructing this per the Cheers checklist. Um, the most recent version actually just came out a couple of months ago in our Mark 10. And then um, the final product will be a publication in a health econ journal um, where somewhere like value on health would, would be would be a good home. So in terms of our speaker, Dr. Goldstein is a medical oncologist. He's a hematologist internship, or sorry, internist and senior lecturer. And he spent the past six years as a clinician, researcher, and policymaker in Israel. So Dr. Goldstein has a strong interest in helping health systems to function as efficiently as possible and in order to enable high quality care for all patients. So since January 2021, he's been the uh, medical manager of drug and technology policies in the community division of Clalish Health Services. And in that role, he's responsible for developing new policies that impact 4 million insurers. So he's experienced consulting to healthcare systems and payers globally to develop innovative health policies. And this includes countries like the USA, UK, Israel, Norway, Iceland, and Costa Rica. 
So today, Dr. Gold is talking us, to us about cost savings in healthcare. So basically, based on his experience as an academic researcher and policymaker, he's identified a number of opportunities to save significant healthcare resources while still being able to maintain health outcomes for patients. He's going to highlight the significance of weight-based dosing via the example of an immunotherapy used in several cancers as kind of an example of that. He's also going to talk us through uh, the existence of class effects, where you're basically seeing that one drug can be preferred over another one, and that this can lead to significant cost savings. And we're hoping that from his international experience, he might provide some kind of general tips on how to support smooth implementation of these strategies that can be informative to us, I guess, in the Irish side. So look, I've introduced Dr. Daniel and, uh, and, and, and the topic for today, so I think we can start the seminar. We're probably all ready. Uh, but if you do want to contact me about anything directly, you can. That's my email address. And Dr. Dawson has been kind enough to put his email address at the end of his slides as well. So um, feel free to reach out to either of us. Um, Daniel, I'll let you take over if, if that works for you. Let's see. Okay, so camera and mic are yeah. there. Yeah. And uh, it's not like a movie star or like a movie director. Uh, and slides. Is it shared? Um, no, let me see now. I'm I may have control. So if I there you go, you, may, you should be able to take it. Okay, hold on a minute. So. Excellent. Is it that? Is shared now? It is, yeah. You probably just yeah. want a full screen. Uh, yeah, hold on a minute. Okay, you got it? Yes, perfect. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so we're good to go, right? Okay, so uh, first of all, thank you so much um, to uh, the Colossus program. For, uh, for inviting me. It all started off from a nerdy conversation that we had um, several months ago when, uh, when, I, when he contacted me to discuss um, the nerdiness of the first Markov model that I ever built in health economics, which was related to colorectal cancer. Um, and we discussed uh, sensitivity analyses and discount, uh, discounting rates, et cetera, et cetera. So it all started for me back about nine years ago when I started looking into uh, the health economics of lots of different cancer drugs. Um, and, and I have a few different hats. At that stage, I was in the United States. Uh, and, but I have a few different hats. I'm a, I'm a clinician um, uh, and treat patients in the clinic and in the hospital. Uh, but I'm also a researcher. And more recently, I'm officially, a, 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 I try to translate the research into the policies um, that I make primarily for Clalit, um, but also uh, advise other different systems around the world. Um, and so essentially, I'm going to start with what we would say, what we want to say as a basic understanding of what I essentially learned from three to four years of health economics and pharmacoeconomics of cancer drugs. And what we already know is that cancer drugs are often expensive often poor value, or we could say poor cost effectiveness or a poor ISA, and often unaffordable. That's not always the case, but it's often the case. And so if we take that as our starting point, then we want to try to think about how we can improve the situation. So I started kind of um, looking for uh, solutions to this about for about five or six years ago about how we can try to get around this problem of, oh, it's not, it's too expensive, or it's unaffordable, see if we can make some types of tweaks. And how do we improve the situation? We can make drugs cheaper, essentially asking the drug company to make them cheaper. In England, with their negotiating ability through NICE, they're obviously quite successful at doing that. In other countries, uh, maybe less successful in getting lower prices. We can increase the drug efficacy, so uh, uh, using biomarkers to uh, use drugs only in patients that the drug is actually going to work instead of giving it to the full population. Often, the, such biomarkers are not available. 
what you've already discussed actually with uh, cetuximab and panitumumab in ras wild type uh, disease. So ras is actually a good biomarker, but unfortunately we don't have good biomarkers for many treatments that we give uh, in oncology, hematology, and all other diseases. Um, but ideally we want to give the drugs only to those who benefit. Uh, we could change legislation to improve pricing, making value-based pricing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we could try to make the clinical trials and the regulatory process more efficient so that it doesn't cost as much to bring a drug to the market. I would argue that that may have some benefit, but ultimately the price of anything is what the market is willing to bear. Um, this, these are all debates and discussions that I can talk and debate for hours and hours about it. Um, or what we can try to do is make medical interventions. So this has been my focus for the past five or six years, trying to figure out if we can use what we have but in a more efficient way. Um, and so this is a paper that I wrote together with some uh, a few collaborators, Mark Rutain from the University of Chicago and Alan Lichter, who was a previous uh, president uh, or, or CEO of ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, in JAMA Oncology. And we talked about this new field of what we're calling interventional pharmacoeconomics. It's not entirely a new uh, field because people have been doing some different studies on this field, uh, but without saying that this is our main aim. So the main things, that, the main medical things that we felt that are possible to be more efficient with our drug usage is one therapeutic substitution, give a cheaper drug instead of the more expensive drug where the cost, uh, where, where the efficacy is equal. We can give lower dosages if we think that we can get the same efficacy. We can give uh, dosing less frequently if we think that uh, instead of giving a drug every four weeks, we can give it every eight weeks and it will work just, uh, just as well. Or we can give it with shorter duration. So if normally you would give a drug for a year, perhaps it may work just as well if you give it for six months. Now, as I mentioned, this isn't a new, these aren't new concepts. Um, and different ideas have been put about in different fields. So the classic example of this is in age-related macular degeneration and VEGF inhibition, um, uh, and that's in the and that's not in the field of cancer really. It's in the field of 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 of, of ophthalmology. And so here you had anti-VEGF agents, uh, the bevacizumab, which were being developed for cancer, um, but then at the same time they were developing a small agent, ranibizumab, which was being developed for for eyes. Um, the ranibizumab uh, agent was still in trials for eyes, while uh, the, the, the bevacizumab agent was approved for the treatment of cancer at a lower dose, at a dose of five milligram per kilogram. So a mean, an average patient would need about 375 milligrams. But before this was, uh, uh, but before the ranibizumab was um, uh, approved, they were waiting for the approvals. They heard it worked well from the clinical trials, uh, but they wanted a VEGF inhibitor. So they went upstairs to the to the oncology departments and asked them if they could have a few milligrams of their bevacizumab. And it was only a few milligrams and started injecting it into people's eyes uh, and seeing wonderful results and seeing that it really worked very well at a significantly lower cost of what the ranibizumab was gonna cost because you were just taking a tiny, tiny dosage of the bevacizumab. So, and because of this interest, there was a trial that was run and published in the New England Journal of Medicine and showed that if you gave the bevacizumab uh, for macular degeneration, you got the same effects as if you gave ranibizumab at a massively different cost. So 2000 US dollars versus $50. Um, and so this became uh, not standard practice everywhere, but in some parts of the world and in some health systems, they started doing it. And so in the US, uh, it, by Medicare, they, uh, by doing this, they save 17 billion US dollars of healthcare resources by using bevacizumab instead of ranibizumab. And $3.5 billion of this were direct savings for patients. Now, I put that here mainly uh, because I'm talking today to health economists and policymakers. So to you, it's interesting to hear about the resources saved for the healthcare system. For often when I talk to clinicians, as much as clinicians may want to care about the healthcare system. The truth is they don't really care about the healthcare system. They care about patients. Uh, they care about the toxicity and the financial toxicity for patients. So here it's important to emphasize that this was actually savings for individual patients as well. Now, there's all different ways that um, we can use drugs differently as well. So oral drugs, we know that many oral drugs um, are absorbed differently if you give them with food or without food. And so, 
this is lapatinib, a drug that actually has fallen out of uh, favor, not used so much these days. But uh, the label dosage was five tablets on an empty stomach. However, if you took it with food and with a, a fatty meal, so for example, the, uh, a McDonald's meal, you would only need two tablets to get the same uh, uh, amount of drug in the bloodstream. Uh, I was criticized once when I gave this presentation because they said, oh, well, you're saving, you're, you're giving less drug, but you're causing people to get uh, with diabetes and, 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 and blood pressure and cardiovascular toxicity uh, and, uh, because you're giving them a, a McDonald's value meal. So it doesn't have to be a McDonald's value meal. It can be, it can be any type of meal that you want. Um, but essentially, you can use uh, two-fifths of the dose um, and get the same effect. The same is true for abiraterone, a drug that I use in my clinic uh, for patients with prostate cancer, where it was approved with a 1,000 milligrams on an empty stomach, but with food, uh, the absorption is much higher. So you can see here a study uh, mainly based from Chicago showing the same effect if uh, if you give a quarter of the dose, but with, with a meal. Now, um, uh, and then here's, here's another drug, zoledronic acid, which strengthens the, the bones, which we give, you can use it for sometimes for osteoporosis, but also use it for patients with cancer who have metastasis in the, in the, uh, the, the bones to prevent uh, fractures, etc. And it used to be that we would give this drug every four weeks. However, then there was a study that showed it has exactly the same effect if you give it every 12 weeks. So not only is it uh, um, uh, uh, saves money for the healthcare system and the patients, but also more com more convenient for the patients, um, potentially less toxicity for the patients as well. Um, here's denosumab versus zoledronic acid. Denosumab is a newer agent with a different mechanism of action that's used to prevent fractures as well. And you can see this is more therapeutic uh, in, uh, interchange and saying, well, why do we need the more expensive agent of denosumab if the cheaper agent of zoledronic acid, uh, but based on this, has exactly the same effect. Now, I show these slides as very simplistic types of things, but there is a lot of nuance here, and there's a lot of nuance in, in understanding what, what, what you can make a policy from and what you can't make a policy from and how the policy has to be very um, smart and clever because there are the subgroups of patients who actually need the denosumab. So for example, here, uh, denosumab is preferable for patients with a certain level of kidney function. So it may be that only uh, five to 10% of patients are gonna need the denosumab and the vast majority can get zoledronic acid, but it's, Often when you're making these uh, policies, it's not just a situation of saying everyone gets the cheaper because then you can actually cause harm. So you actually have to know how to interpret the trials and how to understand the nuance, the medical nuance, in order to make a smart policy that doesn't harm patients. Um, but, you, but, but oftentimes it is possible to do that. Um, here's another trial, duration of adjuvant trastuzumab, um, showing that uh, if you gave uh, uh, trastuzumab for HER2 positive breast cancer patients um, that uh, uh, 12 months uh, was the standard, but uh, this giving it for six months appears to have the same effect. Now, again, there's been lots of arguments and debates about the statistics uh, of this. Oftentimes, when we're trying to reduce the consumption of an expensive drug, somebody is going to be harmed by that namely the manufacturer of the expensive drug. And so then there's a whole, oftentimes a whole process of lobbying from, from, doctor, from, the, from industry sometimes to doctors, trying to highlight what the potential harms to patients may be. So again, it has to be carefully done and being aware of the challenges that are gonna happen. Because in any healthcare system, there are the, uh, different types of lobbies that will happen. So if we don't think how to, implement the policies, first of all, medically and scientifically intelligent policies, but also smoothly done through appropriate discussions with the medical, the leaders of the medical community for them to understand that this isn't just um, the healthcare system coming along with a heavy hand um, and trying to, uh, and, and just sort of saving money without proper thought about how to do it, that they can understand that actually it's being done in an intelligent and careful way, that it can save money for the healthcare system, that that money can be used for other medical purposes, um, but, but and that the policy won't harm patients. So 
Now, I highlighted a few examples here, um, but there's many other uh, examples of many other oral cancer drugs. So here, Mark Rutain and Alan Lichter looked at a bunch of oral cancer drugs and, and saw opportunities. Some of the examples I've highlighted here, the evidence may not be the level of evidence that may be sufficient to implement a policy. So what, what level of evidence is required um, to do, let's say, a de-escalation uh, strategy or, or a de-escalation policy. Sometimes uh, the standard way is to have a large non-inferiority study. However, here we've argued that near equivalence and uh, less, uh, uh, the near equivalence data uh, should be sufficient as well, using potentially surrogate endpoints and looking carefully at the width of the non-inferiority margin that would be used. Now, in different healthcare systems, there may be more willingness to sacrifice that very minor amount of statistical certainty in order to make massive resources that can be used for other purposes and have a net health positive effect. So, uh, so, for example, if we raise a question in, let's say, a very poor country where they give a year of, her, of, of trastuzumab, could they, would they be willing to sacrifice a little bit of perfect statistical certainty in order to save that money? Yes, I think so. However, potentially in a very wealthy country where money, money is no object, maybe they're not so willing to sacrifice statistical certainty or absolute statistical certainty. So everything has to be tailored specifically towards um, taking into account risk, trade-offs, certainty. These are all economic terms that when I'm speaking to economists, you'll understand it all well. Um, now, uh, how do we even study? So we can run clinical trials as well to look at de-escalation. And even running clinical trials um, can even be um, beneficial just to, uh, to the health system itself. So here we talk about ibrutinib, a drug used in uh, lymphoma. And here we know that the drug is dosed much higher than is necessary, and it causes cardiac toxicity as well. And with reduced dosing, you can reduce that cardiac toxicity and potentially cardiac mortality, uh, and also save money for the healthcare system. And just by developing a trial, even if we don't wait for the results of the trial, the saving that the healthcare system would make, just by enrolling the patients, and even using some of the money to run the trial itself, the, 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 by enrolling 20 patients in a, in a center, you'd make 1.3 million US dollars of savings just by running the trial on 20, uh, uh, recruiting 20 patients for that, for, on that center. Um, never mind once the results come back and, and, and prove our hypothesis that then the policy will change across the whole healthcare system, et cetera. Now, there's two approaches and this de-escalation um, uh, uh, strategy. There's one approach is as we talk about running de-escalation trials, recruiting patients, uh, studying lower doses, longer intervals, uh, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we run the trials and the main results will come in three, four, five years time and then there may be some statistical debate, etc. But you may manage to reduce expenditure by 50%, uh, etc. Or, so you have to wait for those results and that's and that I think is hugely important and we have different trials that are being run in different parts of the world. The other opportunity is to implement health policies now and get the benefit now. Now, uh, with these strategies, you often can't be quite as aggressive because the data, you need stronger data, but there are some things that you can do that are, that are robust, supported strongly by the data um, and you can uh, get the res and you can have the benefits now and not have to wait. So I'm going to talk about two different policies here that can be implemented, uh, have already been implemented in different parts of the world, um, and we'll talk about. Them. So weight-based dosing of checkpoint inhibitors, and then uh, talk a bit about class effects. So immunotherapy is a revolution in cancer care. We we already can see the amazing results of these therapies in patients with metastatic melanoma, curing, potentially curing perhaps 50% of these patients who otherwise previously before the arrival of immunotherapy would have died. Um, in other diseases, it doesn't always work quite as well. So triple negative breast cancer, the efficacy is much more marginal. So it obviously depends on the disease you're treating. But really a revolution in cancer care and absolutely appropriate that the inventors got the Nobel Prize a few years ago. Um, 
But let's look at the dosages of these drugs. So this is the PD-1 receptor occupancy of nivolumab. The standard dose that's given is approximately three milligram per kilogram every three weeks. And so you can see that, uh, sorry, you can see that here, but the dose when they developed the phase one study, the receptor occupancy is essentially the same across the board, even at much lower doses, a 0.1 milligram per kilogram. In the phase one study as well, you can see the response rates, again, small numbers of patients, but response rates very similar in patients getting all different dosages. Remember, the dose taken forward to the trials was three milligram per kilogram every two weeks. Uh, but, um, and then here you can see a phase two randomized trial showing that the efficacy, the pr progression-free survival, and the overall survival was equivalent irrespective of, of, of what dosage you're getting. So here saying 0.3 milligram per kilogram looks to be a perfectly acceptable dose. Um, but again, the dose taken forward is approximately 10 times that amount, or uh, approximately 10 times that amount, slightly less. Atezolizumab, another drug uh, of great interest to me, and perhaps my favorite drug um, in, in immunotherapy with regard to these opportunities, although market share is smaller than uh, pembrolizumab that we'll talk about shortly. But the, the manufacturer stated that the target trough was six micrograms per milliliter. However, with the currently approved FDA dosages of 1200 milligram every three weeks, it's the, the first dose trough is 95 micrograms per milliliter. That means, what's the trough? It's the amount of, after you give the first dose, it's the amount of drug left in the bloodstream just before you give the second dose. So it's 95. So it's 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 infinitely more than what the manufacturer has already stated is the required amount. The steady state trough, because uh, the drug accumulates with time, is 225. So it's just way higher than necessary. And so there's potential for logarithmic uh, dose reductions. Uh, and even personalized dosing. Pembrolizumab, the standard dose uh, initially was two milligram per kilogram every three weeks, but we can see essentially very similar uh, uh, amount of uh, uh, responses in patients with one milligram per kilogram. And here you can see that uh, and what the, these are pharmacokinetic models published by the manufacturer and used by the FDA showing that the target engagement is equivalent anywhere above 0.8 milligram per kilogram every three weeks. So essentially what th this introduction of the pharmacokinetics of the drug shows you is that there is no dose response relationship for checkpoint inhibitors and that the dosages are far higher than necessary um, uh, to get the optimal responses. This is pharmacologic uh, kind of uh, nerdiness, if you want to call it that. Um, and pharmacologic nerdiness doesn't always work well when it comes to laws and regulation and uh, Ministry of Health and talking to clinicians, et cetera, et cetera. So then we can think about, well, okay, we there were small studies, there are only pharmacokinetic models, et cetera, et cetera. Is it possible to lower a dose based on something that there is from the FDA and the, and the manufacturer? So let's look at pembrolizumab. It's the number. It's number two in terms of revenue annually, globally, fourteen billion dollars of annual sales, um, and that's a, a, that cost is is incurred by patients and healthcare systems around the world. And the dosing of pembrolizumab initially it was labelled at two milligram per kilogram every three weeks, um, and those were the first approvals um, for both second line meta, uh, metastatic lung cancer as well as metastatic melanoma. But then the strategy of the company, in fact, of all of the companies, was to change and give everyone a fixed dose, saying we can give everyone a fixed dose, it'll be easier, you don't have to weigh patients, it'll be more convenient. And so, uh, and so it went to 200 milligrams every three weeks. However, um, we said, well, hold on a minute, if, it, if, it, if it's the same efficacy, then and an average patient weighs only 75 kilo, um, and then the average patient requires only 150 milligram, and that's three quarters of the dosage. So you can reduce the dose by 25 percent. And so we published this, uh, the budget impact analysis, calculating this. This was kind of the first, uh, the first idea and suggestion of what could be done here. Um, uh, and we said that in first line lung cancer, the U.S. could save 0.8 billion dollars annually, um, uh, and, and that would actually be more now because that was only on. PDL1 positive lung cancer. So once you expand the indications, it'll be a lot more. It was a bit tricky though. Uh, the company at the time had both 50 milligram 
vials on the market as well as 100 milligram vials, but they removed the 50 milligram vials from the market, making it more difficult to do vial sharing. But it is still to, still possible. And here again is the nuance of understanding how, how it's possible to do it and the, and the justification of it. So that, that, that 50 milligram vial was removed. Now, there is argument saying, no, you can't, uh, you can't uh, uh, change the dosage and use weight-based dosing for all the other indications because the clinical trials were not with weight-based dosing. However, uh, um, the FDA, as well as the EMA, as well as the manufacturers themselves, use pharmacokinetic models specifically to, to provide different dosing options on the labels of the drugs. So they use a PK model to change the pembrolizumab dose uh, retroactively for the first uh, few uh, indications. And it's also been used on all these other immunotherapies as well. And even cetuximab, uh, which we'll come to later, they've used um, PK models to change dosing, dosing options. So essentially the crux of the matter comes to this, was that in second line lung cancer and melanoma, in the first trials, it was two milligram per kilogram. And then they used a PK model to uh, uh, the company used the PK model and requested the FDA to retroactively change that label to 200 so that everybody could get 200. And so depending on a PK model and the company and the FDA said the PK model is robust and I agree it was robust. And so therefore they changed, the, they changed it. And so, and then there was another 18, 19 indications in all other diseases and subsequently afterwards. So we therefore say, if you're able to go in that direction, then we can also go in the other direction. If a clinical trial was 200 milligrams, using 200 milligrams fixed, then you can use the PK model to go in the other direction and say, well, we want to use two milligram per kilogram. And this essentially has been the strategy of the pol of policies. So the Canadians were the first, I think, to uh, follow on the idea that we suggested. And they, they did a, a very large 50 page um, analysis of the pharmacokinetics, looked at the whole details and, uh, and came to the conclusion that, that, that it's completely justified to use weight-based dosing. And they looked at the PK and they said it's completely justified. And, uh, and then it became their strategy in most Canadian provinces. And, it was in, um, and now since then, it's spread to other countries around the world, uh, with Denmark, partially in Israel, we can talk a little bit about the story. Iceland, it's in parts of the Netherlands and Erasmus. And in the USA, it's in Kaiser Permanente in most indications. Now, how to implement uh, these types of policies smoothly uh, is also uh, an art uh, in trying to understand uh, how to do it in a smooth way, um, knowing that there's going to be opposition uh, developing from the other side of, from the manufacturer. Um, so we can definitely talk more about different strategies that are different arguments that will be put up against the strategy, um, as well as uh, um, how to combat these arguments. Um, and in addition, how to try to do it in a politically sensitive and emotionally sensitive way. Um, but ultimately, the potential benefit of weight-based dosing of pembrolizumab is that with $14 billion of annual sales, if the whole world essentially uh, did this, uh, then there will be 25% uh, less drug-infused, $3.5 billion of annual savings globally. And that can be used to help patients for other underfunded healthcare services or to reduce uh, insurance premiums or personal financial toxicity. So I do this, some people are, are a bit skeptical of insurance companies or uh, healthcare systems. They think they're just wanting to save money. And sometimes they're absolutely right. I come at this from a position of health economics and public health. Um, and the idealistic way that I look at it is that um, it's to save money and that money should be going uh, and be used for other good purposes and being redistributed to, in order to have a net health positive benefit. Um, there is also a potential for reduced duration of Im immune related adverse events, so it may be more safe to give a lower dosage as well, although this hasn't yet been fully proven. Um, okay, so that's weight based dosing of pembrolizumab. Um, and now uh, we're going to talk a little bit about class effects, um, and particularly. Uh, as, as this is being hosted by the Colossus program, we're going to focus on uh, one example in colorectal cancer, but not to say that colorectal cancer is the only place where there's 
opportunities to take advantage of class effects. So what what is a class effect? Um, this is this is kind of a main, the main paper that was published in JAMA uh, over 20 years ago, kind of suggesting how you define a class effect, what what, what, what type of evidence do you have to have for a class effect, um, and how to justify that there is a class effect. Now, why did we why did this all come up uh, uh, 20, 25 years ago? Because they had this idea that mostly with drugs like uh, um, ACE inhibitors, antihypertensives, as well as um, uh, a number of other drugs at the time, where they started to see, well, hold on a minute, they basically have the same mechanism. Can't we uh, just choose one and then get negotiate for the lower price um, and do that? And we see that being done in hospitals. So oftentimes when I've worked in a hospital and we give a low molecular weight heparin or a proton pump inhibitor. We can't choose whatever, you know, there are four or five drugs that are marketed, but I don't have the liberty to choose whichever one I want. I have to choose the one that the hospital has a, a, a negotiated agreement with to purchase that drug because they're considered all the same and they've negotiated the best price with one drug. And so we choose that drug. Now, uh, and that was done essentially quite a bit, I think, for antihypertensives and, uh, uh, and those types of I don't want to say smaller drugs, etc. But cancer was considered, no, 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 you can't touch cancer drugs because cancer is too important a disease and we, we don't want to mess with cancer drugs because uh, it's cancer. This isn't just blood pressure, this is cancer. Um, I fundamentally disagree with that approach. Um, it, it was done for uh, cancer causes, uh, causes death sometimes, but heart disease where ACE inhibitors were used also causes death. And I don't see any reason why cancer should be uh, should, should, should not uh, have the opportunity for looking at class effects. What is the potential opportunity with class effects? Essentially, if you see three or four drugs in the same class, you can show that the data is basically equivalent. Um, then the healthcare payer can negotiate, put out a tender, whatever mechanism you want to do, put out a tender, negotiate for the lowest price. Again, it has to be done in a smart way because um, there's different tricks that go on there. Um, and then use that tender to then prefer one drug over another. Um, and usually doing such a strategy uh, will reduce prices significantly. Now, prices obviously are often quite secretive. Uh, so I can't tell you exactly what prices are. But what this often leads to is a price reduction or a cost reduction of approximately 30%, um, give or take. You can discuss with different countries that do it. Um, and that's around about the number that might be uh, touted. It's not done widely with cancer drugs yet. Uh, it's done a little bit. It's done in uh, Norway. Um, it's been done a little bit in Israel uh, and in a few other places. Um, but this is where there's great opportunity. So let's just take an example of uh, of colon cancer and RAS uh, wild type colon cancer, where you have cetuximab and panitumumab, two different agents. Um, but many studies demonstrating the same efficacy. We can look at the two different agents, the details of it, what the label dosing is. There's often a little bit of nuance with, with some differences with the one's mouse, humer, mouse human chimeric, one's fully humanized. Uh, as a result of that, the rate of severe infusion reactions is slightly different, but not really clinically different uh, um, there. So uh, um, there's a, a sidedness issue that some people uh, consider that the left-sided tumors are more likely to respond to EGFR inhibitors than right-sided tumors, but there's no evidence to, to suggest that the choice of EGFR inhibitor and tumor lab or cetuximab impacts this effect. It, it's a rare situation with this drug that there's actually a head-to-head -head trial comparing cetuximab and panitumumab. Usually, when we look at class effects, there's usually no head-to-head -head trial, because usually it's not in the interest of the manufacturer to do a head-to-head -head trial, because then they might end up losing market share. Um, but here there actually is, uh, but you can still infer class effect without a head-to-head -head trial. But here there is a head-to-head -head trial, um, and here you can see the data, the efficacy, the progression-free survival, overall survival is identical. Um, you can look at the adverse event rates. Adverse event rates are very similar. Um, infusion reactions possibly slightly different. And so you have to take that into account a little bit and make the policy uh, thoughtful and medically appropriate to take into account this infusion reaction issue. And so uh, 
Well, so we'll come to that. The guidelines, you can look at the, the NCCN guidelines, which I don't pay attention to a lot of things related to the NCCN guidelines. I think that they are overly permissive usually um, and don't really take into account uh, economic issues. Um, but here you can see that they don't distinguish between one or the other. Um, infusion times is a slight difference. So this was one of the things that I think one of the companies planted that, oh, Panitumab is preferable because um, the infusion centers uh, are overwhelmed with uh, patients and they don't have enough staff and they don't have enough chairs. And so Panitumab is preferable because the patient only has to sit in the chair for 60 minutes instead of 120 minutes. And so when we created the policy, so the policy suggestion was given almost identical efficacy, it can, it can be considered a class effect. You can do a tender and choose whichever one is cheaper. However, if uh, if there's a severe fusion reaction, we would allow switching from one to the other. And that seems totally reasonable. Now, uh, cetuximab is approved also in head and neck, but not in, 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 um, in colon cancer. So it would relate only to colon cancer. And also we incorporated into the policy something related to uh, um, the challenges related to the infusion center if there was a genuine problem of, of it actually impacting the, the chair space in the infusion center. Actually, when we calculated it, in the overall uh, number of cancer patients sitting in chairs and the number of hours in the infusion center, actually the difference between everybody getting panitumumab versus cetuximab really was, 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 was a rounding error. Um, but in order to keep everybody happy, um, we incorporated something into that to, 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 to account for that issue of the chair time. Um, now, that's the example of cetuximab uh, panitumab. There are a number of other um, uh, opportunities, um, all with their own amounts of nuance about the data available, how you would do it medically, all different different challenges, different issues, but essentially there's opportunities to do uh, tendering processes and to take advantage of the class effects in lanreotide or triotide, in the CDK4-6 inhibitors in breast cancer, with uh, the BRAF-MEC inhibitor combinations, with PARP inhibitors, with checkpoint inhibitors as well, as well as with androgen receptor blockers um, used in prostate cancer. Um, so, uh, um, I just want to take take this moment to also thank you, to put a shout out to thanks to the many collaborators I've worked with, absolutely amazing people, Mark Retain at the University of Chicago, um, Cody and Doug at uh, NCI, uh, my friends at OCCO, the Optimal Cancer Care Alliance, um, as well as in Clalit and uh, Rabin Medical Center where where, I'm, where I see patients. Feel free to contact me by email. I have a website which kind of contains some of the different studies that we've done and different things, but feel free to reach out to me um, and uh, we can talk about different ways that potentially we could work together in the future. So I'm gonna, uh, I think I didn't even, hopefully I just hit my 14 minutes. Uh, so I'm gonna end there and um, Usually, uh, if I give this presentation live, people start throwing tomatoes at me. Um, but given that via that it's via uh, 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 Teams or Zoom, then uh, no tomatoes allowed. You just get uh, viruses and stuff like that, Daniel. That was that was very good, excellent. Thank you very much. I think um, I think everyone will agree that that was um, extremely interesting. So what we might do is, in terms of in terms of questions, we might ask people to raise their hands, um, and then I can unmute people and. Uh, and, and see what they have uh, what they have to ask you. Um, so we'll start with, with James Amani. Let me just unmute James. Uh, there we go. There you go, James, you should be live. Oh, lovely. Um, well, I just want to say thanks very much, Jonathan, and thanks, Daniel. I thought that was a, a great talk. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, no tomatoes from here. You're speaking to the, to the converted because I'm a health economist. And um, almost in a way, you know, this uh, weight based dosing, you know, it, it almost seems so obvious. It almost seems criminal that this wouldn't be conducted or people would show resistance uh, to, towards it. Um, one thing I am interested about is this works when the reimbursed prices are set in accordance with the regulated doses. And if we all go to weight based dosages, then pharma companies then have to, you know, bring their prices up back uh, in alignment. So, uh, I could see why this would work as a as a once-off, or if you are 
a smaller country and the US doesn't cotton on to it. Um, but the, the benefits of this in part might evaporate in the long run if we all got rational. But I know that might be a long time before we got this. There's probably still an awful lot to gain in the interim. I'm sure you've heard that comment before. Right. Um, so uh, first of all, I realized, uh, Jonathan, I called you Andrew, but actually it's Jonathan, so I, I, I apologize. No um, uh, so, so thank you for that question. And I, I agree entirely, yeah, we've absolutely had that uh, question raised. This solution that we're providing is not, it, it's, it's, it's a far from ideal solution. I wish we didn't have to do this nonsense. I, I'd rather just have a proper crisis and not have to, not have to do this nonsense. Um, but meanwhile, what, uh, while the prices are, are, are high, this is, this is uh, an alternative strategy to try to do something about it. Um, uh, correct entirely that they can just raise the prices, depending on, on the country that you're in, if the prices are locked or not. So, for example, in Israel, the prices are locked once it enters uh, um, the uh, approval process, they're already locked. Now, in America, um, uh, if everybody starts doing it, so prices increase anyway in America. We published a paper about this. They're always increasing every quarter anyway. The question is whether or not if everyone started doing it, then they'll just crank up the price uh, uh, by 25%. Um, we do have experience of uh, this was related to um, Ibrutinib actually, where it was a packaging issue. And actually we went to the Washington Post and said, this is crazy. And then we forced the company through negative publicity to actually re re go back and, and go back to the original way of packaging, et cetera. So you can use negative publicity, but but um, to try to push it back, it may not work always, uh, but, but I agree with you. Your point is well taken. And I agree, it's gonna take a while until everybody is rational. So in the meantime, uh, we'll, we might as well try and do some of these things where the healthcare system would allow it. Um, yeah. That's, thanks again for a great talk. Thanks, uh, James, for your question. So, will Robert O'Connor uh, has his hand up, so I'll just um, I'll, I'll, I'll unmute you there, Robert. So, you should be able to. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Am I coming in okay? You are perfect, yeah, exactly. Daniel, great uh, presentation. Um, one comment and, and one question, if I might. So, the, the first comment is um, the data around this and, and it extends not just to cancer as you, as you touched on, but to many different diseases. Um, and as our, our drug reimbursement bill goes up globally, um, very important. But it suggests that we maybe need to look uh, earlier stage at the basic design of some of the trials and, and how they're conducted and, and there be some sort of oversight of that to take in um, the potential success of the trial or the pharmacoeconomic implications of that. So that's the first thing is a comment. Second thing is is a query, um, and I, I suppose I've I've uh, handled questions and queries from from people who maybe um, are taking a particular existing uh, therapy, and then uh, I suggest they go on a generic. And it can be emotionally quite challenging. They, they, I suppose the human factor isn't built into what we've been discussing today, and people can become very wedded to a medicine for particular reasons in that. And I think it can be a complex conversation between a clinician. So just wondering if you have any thoughts on, I suppose, the human side of that and, and what it's like um, to be a patient trying to navigate and, and you know get the best potential outcome, which you might, might associate with a pharmaceutical company press release against the backdrop of cold, hard, dirty facts like you've been outlining today. Right, right. Um, so, uh, so first of all, with regard to the comment about clinical trials, I agree entirely. Um, when the clinical trial, you know, the clinical trial, once it's done, if this clinical trial is done after the price is already set, then they need to maximize profit. So often they are trying to give the drug for as long as possible. And, you know, there's all different stories about trastuzumab, for example, that they wanted to design the trial for six months, the, the initial registration trial. Um, the, the investigators wanted to do it for six months, but the company didn't want it, etc. Um, the ability to actually influence the way that the trials are designed, uh, I don't think that we have any ability to do that. Uh, even though there are academics as the clinical investigators, um, they uh, uh, are not always so academic and uh, they need to please the, uh, the sponsor. Um, with regard to the human side, I agree entirely. Um, this, this has been a major learning process for, for me. Um, uh, you know, as a clinician and as an oncologist, 
you would want to think and imagine that I actually understand the human side of life. Um, and, I, and I like to think that I'm quite good at it in the clinic. Um, and I think I am good at it in the clinic. However, I, I kind of thought that, well, when we're looking at the data and evidence and, and this, and I became kind of academic and everything, then, uh, you know, why do we have to be nice to doctors? Just tell them this is, this is the dose, this is what we're doing, you know, just enforce it. Um, and well, let me go back a little bit. The whole evolution of this weight-based dosing of embolizumab was that I had this idea, I suggested it to a bunch of my colleagues, and nobody really wanted to do it. They were like, ah, I don't want to, I don't want to waste my time. And then I understood that they don't want the headache of it. They don't want the headache of telling patients and that in that human side. And you know, maybe they might be opening themselves up to a lawsuit uh, for patients that don't respond. And obviously, patients don't respond. So then we understood that ah. How about if we force you to do it? If then that if for you, you, it's not you as a clinician, you're not the guilty one. You just say, ah, oh, it's the healthcare the payer, it's the healthcare system that did this, and then then they can wash their hands and they don't need to. And so then one, and, and they understood that clinically it had the same effect. So then they were actually, they said, yes, force us, because then they will make it easier for us. And we're actually experiencing the same thing with uh, switching with uh, uh, biosimilars. So. Uh, I do work with biosimilars as well. well. And again, outside of oncology, I'm doing stuff in hematology and rheumatology. So the biosimilars, we're trying to do a process of switching patients, stable patients with rheumatoid arthritis and switching them to biosimilars. Medically, it's completely and utterly clean, but the rheumatologists, they don't really want the headache of trying to persuade the patient. And it's come to understanding that the only way to do it is for us to force them. So you know, even though I don't want to be a forcing person, but it, it has to come from above. So then you take this notion of forcing, but then the patients then are unhappy and uncomfortable. Um, and some amount of propaganda that gets uh, put up by the manufacturer as well to say, you know, some of the patient support uh, organizations um, are heavily funded by industry, um, not always quite so rational. Um, and so this whole thing has definitely been a major learning process from the human side, uh, on the human side for me about policies and that creating a policy isn't just about figuring out what is uh, medically right and what is safe and what is legal. Um, it's also about getting the clinicians on board um, as well as getting the patient support organisations on board. Um, and I think uh, having talked to different people who do these types of things, actually, uh, the Norwegians actually seem to be quite good at this uh, from talking to them and hearing what they do, trying like making sure that they smoothen the process uh, in order for it to happen. And ultimately, if the clinician is comfortable that it's OK, and if the clinician doesn't hate the healthcare system uh, with a passion, um, then they will probably just like let it kind of go smoothly. Oftentimes, though, even if medically they think it's OK, the clinicians may just have a visceral objection to the payers, to the healthcare payers. Um, uh, and I don't think this is specifically unique to individual countries. Maybe in some countries it's worse than others. So it does have to be a, a kind of, um, th there does have to be a political process working with the clinicians as well and, uh, in order that it goes relatively more smoothly than uh, and, and, and if the clinicians are comfortable with it and the patient support organisations are comfortable with it, usually that I think will translate to the patients also being comfortable with it. Yeah, really interesting. Um, so what I might do is I'm, I'm, I, I, I always forget that people, not, not everyone is at, in, their, in a comfortable space where they can talk on mic. So if anyone wants to put any questions into the chat, I can read them out on their behalf. But a question that I had, Daniel, um, which I alluded to before is, in terms of implementation, um, and particularly based on your experience, I guess, internationally of working with different organizations and, and in different different geographic settings, and, and what what have been some of the things that you've seen that have been key or, or, or central to, to supporting some of these policies? Um, the, um, what are some of the things? So, um, I think that first of all, you have to be able to identify somebody within 
the um, the payer within the 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 people who actually are in the the payers, not the researchers, uh, but the payers who actually see this and say, yeah, we want to do this and we want to. Uh, oftentimes, they're a bit more conservative, and this might yeah you know, sounds like a bit of a headache. Oh, what what if you know we get negative press and what if the doctors object and oh they get scared off relatively easily. Um, and so you have to have somebody from the payer who actually says, you know what, this is a ton of money and it doesn't harm patients and we need to create the process and we need to make the process and make it happen. Oftentimes, um, the payer, uh, um, not that much in it for them to, to go and do something that's new and it's against the FDA label. How could we possibly do something against the FDA label? Um, but once there's a few countries that have done it, um, then uh, it makes it easier for other countries to to uh, to follow. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm may, I mean, the Canadians deserve tremendous credit because they really went out and did it first um, uh, and said, we're going to do it. But even then, not other, other countries were slow to take up and everything, even though it medically is safe. Um, I think you also have to have clinical champions as well. Um, people who are from somebody, you know, be connected with people from the clinical community um, who are willing to take this forward. Usually it's not the main leader of that field or the main, uh, uh, the main head of the department of the main hospital, because often um, they are not always the best scientists and not always the people that care the most about national resources. They may be good politicians, um, but it's a matter of identifying somebody who's clinical who, sometimes you can find somebody clinical who likes it, but they're like too wacky and too weird. and They're considered an outsider as well. So it's a matter of finding the clinical people um, uh, that are interested to help. Brilliant. Um, okay, well, we have uh, Sarah Walpole has her, her hand up, so I'm going to uh, just turn your mic on there, Sarah. When you're done asking your question, there was just something in the chat that someone wanted to answer. Um, thank you. Uh, that was a fascinating book and um, really interesting kind of questions raised. I, I found the um, comments that you made around risk and the willingness to, to accept this with heart disease drugs, but less so cancer drugs, really interesting, especially given that obviously there is a risk of giving too high doses of drugs. So it looks like we tend to only look at one side of the equation on, in terms of risk. Um, the question I wanted to ask was, um, I'm a clinical fellow I'm based at NICE, um, National Institute for Health and Care Athletes, um, and my background is in infectious diseases, Reg. Um, NICE is currently looking at environmental sustainability and uh, what its role is in um, responding to the, the challenges of moving the health service to a more environmentally sustainable one. Um, and we're looking at things like um, the greenhouse, consider which considerations should be taken into account in terms of environmental impacts, and that might include things like greenhouse gas emissions and emissions um, a toxicity in water and soil in terms of um, uh, drug uh, usage and, and police. Um, so you talked about the flexibility of prices when you start to suggest that you give lower doses, um, but obviously in terms of environmental impacts, there, there isn't that kind of, you, you'll still get those benefits. Um, there won't be sort of a price flex, you'll still see the benefit of reduced greenhouse gas emissions if you give lower doses across a, a broad number of patients. So I just wondered whether that kind of lever and that necessity to act on environmental sustainability is something that you've thought about or something that might help to strengthen the, the case for this. So, um, so, so first of all, uh, regarding, regarding risk, uh, I agree entirely. I, I think there's a massive problem amongst healthcare professionals as well as um, uh, as well as the general public in understanding risk and trade-offs. I think it, I mean, you see it throughout Corona and everything, um, but just like a massive uh, inability to consider con to consider risk and trade-offs. Uh, but I think it's always important to consider it. Um, 
Regarding environmental uh, uh, effects, you're the, you're, you're the second person that I've ever heard mention it. It has never, hardly ever been ever raised, but um, a collaborator of mine, Garth Strobern, who I published paper with, I think he's working on something related to this. And I had one half conversation with somebody hearing that he was doing it. But aside from that, I've never heard anything about it. But I'm happy, if you email me, I'm happy to check with him uh, and find out if he was doing something. I think I heard that he was working on something related to it. But otherwise, I've, otherwise I've never heard anything about it. Not that it shouldn't be, shouldn't be investigated. But uh, yeah, it's another angle to add to it, to support it. Brilliant, Daniel. So we have a, we have a, a question in the chat here from Anna Willis, Willis, sorry, and it says, thank you for a really interesting presentation, which I, I would agree with. I wonder whether you'd consider vial sharing for drugs with white based dosing to save money through reducing drug wastage. Um, yes, I've done a lot of thinking uh, about vial sharing. Um, vial sharing is a uh, so vial sharing is a really interesting issue. Uh, we just put another paper out to in JAMA Oncology a few months ago, actually. Um, so I can forward that to anybody that needs it. But yes, this also relates specifically to risk and trade-offs. So there's two types of vials. There's multi-dose vials and single-dose vials. Here we're talking about single-dose vials, which officially they're only supposed to be used for single patients. And when it's only available in a 100 milligram uh, vial, uh, and you're planning to share between patients, then you do have to use vial sharing in order to uh, gain some of the benefit. There are some healthcare systems um, that uh, do don't exactly do weight-based dosing, but use uh, lower dosing. For example, in some parts of of of, chi of China, Singapore, and stuff, they've got a lot of people who weigh only 50 kilograms, and if they weigh only 50 kilograms, they just give them a 100 milligram vial, and that's it. But if they weigh more, then they're given the 200, but they're still saving a massive amount because so many people weigh uh, so much smaller than, uh, you know, so small and you need 100 milligrams. But with with that being said, um, you can do vial sharing. If you look on the label of the pembrolizumab vials, it says that it's stable and sterile for up to 24 hours. Um, that's not because it is actually only stable and sterile for up to 24 hours. That's because that's what the FDA requires the company to check in order for it to get to get the label. So they check it uh, and, they, and then it comes 24 hours. Now there's other studies subsequently, there's one from South Korea, I think I can't remember exactly where, that shows that actually sterility and stability is much longer. There's two, or sterility is much longer. Um, the safety and sterility is, is the concern. And there was a, a, a thing against using vial sharing because they said you can cross contaminate and you can cause infections between different patients etc cetera, etc cetera. we then actually went back to have a look at the evidence that, that led to that um, relatively conservative approach and saying that you shouldn't be doing vial sharing with single dose vials and found that the evidence is really only that only happens if you're you know sharing needles between patients and doing all sorts of unsterile techniques and so we kind of looked at all that and published it and showed it that really if you use appropriate sterile techniques you can do vial sharing and so in order to maximize these benefits you would have to do vial sharing it's a little bit tricky in some healthcare systems for example in the united states uh, when you've got multiple different uh, payers in a standard hospital system, then you've got some that might be doing weight based and some that won't, and you can't vial share between different patients because they've got different insurers, et cetera, et cetera. So they'll be complicated. But in a closed system, like, for example, Kaiser Permanente in the US or Canada or in Israel and, uh, or in England, um, uh, I'm not exactly sure how the Irish system works, but you can tell me if everybody's, if it's single payer. Um, but it, uh, it should be possible in other, other systems. Excellent, really interesting. Um, I don't think we have any more questions. I um, oh, okay, we have one. Neve, you were got in just in time. Neve Hanley, thanks for a great presentation. In relation to weight-based dosing, are there any gender differences in terms of drugs efficacy? No, no. We we, we looked at um, you know the there was a bunch. There's all different arguments tried to be raised to try to push back against it, and we've looked at many different things. Um, there's, there's not considered to be any gender, gender differences. Okay, re really interesting. Okay, well, look, I think if we are out of questions, um, that we'll close the seminar now. I'd like to thank everyone for attending, and particularly our speaker, Dr. Goldstein, of course, Colossus. 
uh, but especially Professor Kathleen Bennett, who's kind of supported this whole thing behind the scenes here in RCSI. So it's a shout out to Kathleen there. Um, Dr. Goldstein has given me permission to share his email, which I've put into the chat. So if anyone wants that, um, go right in there. And other than that, um, this is recorded. You will get an email soon to say that this is recorded, uh, how to access that video. So thank you again, Dr. Goldstein. I'm going to give you the, the emoji applause because it's really a bit sad to sit here by myself clapping, but uh, really excellent work. Thanks so much. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you.